Hi, this is Steve at blessedhopeforever.com. Well, Passover is today. Also, Purim, a Jewish holiday that commemorates the saving of the Jewish people from Haman, who was planning to kill all the Jews, March 21. We're at the 14th day of the month of Nisan, month one, on the Hebrew calendar. Passover is today. And so today Christ died in our place. In these videos, we've been studying together in the Epistle to the Romans, verse by verse. And in our last study together, we were discussing the profound truths that are presented to us in chapter 7. What I find amazing about chapter 7 is that out of all of Scripture, chapter 7 of, of Romans seems to encapsulate the entire experience of the Christian life, the Christian walk. That's why I haven't been in any hurry to, to leave it. So we've been discussing these truths and how that the law is holy, just, and good, but the purpose of the law in the child of God who has died to the law, which includes every single one of you, every single child of God, is to cause us to face up to the fact of our sinfulness and our weakness to accomplish its righteous standard through the law, through our own efforts. That, that law reveals to us that we are sinners by nature. The lesson of this chapter is extraordinarily clear. The wretchedness that we experience in this conflict between the two natures it is not a stage of maturity that we pass through, but it, it is a never-ending, ongoing conflict this side of heaven. Scripture nowhere hints at a future time in which we will no longer cry, O wretched man I am, and for good reason. The conflict actually serves a purpose in our lives. The Holy Spirit is showing us that, that anything that we seek to do or keep from doing in our own strength brings us un, under legal bondage. He's showing us that any rules of conduct that we set up for ourselves or allow others to, to place upon us result in failure and ever-deepening enslavement because the principle of law applies to the self-life. And can produce nothing but self-righteousness. Simply put, the law shows us our need for Christ. The Christian can become convinced that he or she is keeping the law to some extent by not lying or, or bearing false witness or, or whatever else one might want to add to that list, and yet never be the branch that bears good fruit because it was produced not by the, the vine, but by the branch. In the same way that the law revealed Israel's sinfulness and her need for Christ, the law of God that our minds actually delights in reveals our need for Christ who is our life. No, no believer, no Christian is under law but grace. Salvation has to be by grace. It must be. For if it were not, our affection would be set upon things below, not above. Self instead of Christ. Our focus would strictly be on law keeping as a rule of life where we would have no need for Christ. We would just look in Scripture and see it as a book of instructions on how to live the Christian life, just do the best we can, and while all the while we miss seeing Christ. Those who would strongly argue that we must keep the law will never admit that they have no need for Christ because they perceive the Christian life as a life in need of both 
both Jesus Christ and law. Yet Scripture's numerous statements regarding the fact that we have in fact died to the law in order that we might bear fruit unto God proves this not to be the case. Now there's a number of reasons for this misunderstanding of the Christian walk lack of diligent study where we might come to know the truth allowing others to bring us into bondage is another popular opinion is another the majority of Christianity today exists operates functions in this realm of unrecognized slavery to the old man, the flesh. But the primary reason, I believe, is because of the very nature of the old man itself, the nature that is in bondage to itself. Folks, the old man will never change. In fact, it will become more corrupt day by day. It is forever bound by the dictates of its own nature its own character. This is why God had to quicken us from the dead and give us life before we could believe and accept or repent or do anything else. It was because of the bondage of the will, self-will. It is in bondage to itself. Self seeks self. Self promotes self. Self congratulates and praises self. Self, the old man. Self is what it is. Self. The distance that stands in between self and Christ is the gulf between heaven and hell. Self seeks its own interests. Self is constantly involved in self-fulfilling activity. Sometimes it looks good, sometimes it looks bad. God elected not to eradicate self. God determined not to regenerate self, change or improve self, or transform self. What God did was put self to death. This is why we were made a new creation in Christ Jesus. Many falsely assume God helps them live the Christian life. Nothing seems to make more sense than that. They beseech God to bring about change in self. They pray for God to do this when God has nothing to do with that which He put to death with Christ. If we are in fact a single-natured individual, as most of modern Christianity assumes we are, that God cleans up the old man, they can offer no adequate explanation for our having been made a new creation in Christ in the first place. They can offer no adequate explanation for our being, for our having received a new sinless nature wherein the fullness of the triune God dwells, where Christ resides, while the old man continues to exist, though its power has been annulled, in which nothing good exists. No. God does not help us live the Christian life. It's greater than that. It's something far greater, far grander than that. Christ desires to be our life. As Paul says, not I, but Christ. So the conflict rages on. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members, O wretched man that I am. Who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with my mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. Many go through years of struggle and failure, never coming to experience the liberation from the tyranny of sin and bondage to the law. And yet, strangely, these same ones would try and convince us to join them in their defeat. 
when that very experience of defeat is meant to lead us into the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. Romans 8 verse 2. We're going to see that coming up. We exchange the law of sin and death for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. This exchange describes our having ex exchanged the old man for the new. Folks, it's all about where you, you place your focus. Hopefully, all through those years of failure and defeat, we were slowly learning that the harder that we tried to live the Christian life, which is what most Christians believe is our primary goal, the deeper we came under the dominion of the law of sin. We tried and tried and tried, and yet there was nothing but repeated failure and frustration confusion and oftentimes despair and many just gave up altogether they came to the end of themselves and there they left it they left it there not realizing it was purposed by a loving God that was patiently waiting arms outstretched for us to come to him that we might have life and life more abundantly Jesus said, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. It is these that testify about me. And ye will not come to me that you might have life. John chapter 5. So we hungered for life, and yet we brought forth death. Romans 7, 5. But in our wretched attempts to deliver ourselves by means of ourselves... Our loving Father was teaching us what we had to know, that self is our greatest enemy. Christ is our only blessed hope. For to me to live is Christ, said Paul in Philippians chapter 1. When we come to cry from the heart, O wretched man I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Victory is found through our realization of our defeat just as it was when we came to Christ at the beginning. Folks, in the beginning, we knew peace and joy. Why? Because we exchanged our lives for His. But somewhere along our path through life, things changed. We got lost where? We got lost within ourselves. We fell back into that former state of mind that believed that, that God's acceptance of us was based upon our performance. We left that state of mind when we fell to our knees before the cross of Christ, totally bankrupt within ourselves. We, we did not, or we should have not at that time, came to the cross offering Him our best. We should have realized at that time that our best was not good enough, which is why we came to Him in the first place. Can you somehow see what happened? I was alive apart from the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. Same reality occurred as before. We now serve in newness of the Spirit, not in oldness of the letter. Romans 7, 6. Did you know that through His cross, we died to six things? Six. We died to sin, self, the law, the world, Satan, and even death itself. Now that's a heavy death blow. And yet much of what we call Christianity today lives as though it has died to none of that. I rarely meet a Christian who tries to explain away those truths. I do meet many a Christian who fails to acknowledge that those truths exist. We are to walk in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free. Galatians 5.1 This is grace, folks. Yet if I dare mention the word freedom, the world religious system views that as a license to sin. And does so even though it sins. For the strength of the sin is law. All you that labor and are heavy laden, do you, do you know the rest that God gives? The rest He gives. Are you compelled to labor? Is it your desire to labor for the Lord? Well, here, here's some labor for you. 
Hebrews chapter 4. Let us therefore fear lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached, as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. For we which have believed do enter into rest. As he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise, and God did rest the seventh day from all his works. And in this place again, if they shall enter into my rest, seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter therein, and, and they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief. Again, he limits a certain day, saying in David, Today, after so long a time, as it is said, Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. For if Jesus had given them rest, then would be not afterward have spoken of another day. There, there therefore remaineth a rest to the people of God. For he that is entered into his rest, he also has ceased from his own works as God did from his. Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. I want you to note the word that the Holy Spirit uses here is labor. We don't have to parse this word or, or this sentence. Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest. Why does God use the word labor? Because it isn't easy. It isn't easy to cease from our own works as God did from His. In our natural way of thinking, it makes no sense to us whatsoever that the way up might actually be down. Just the opposite of what the text declares when it says that we were taken down into death in order that the life of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. The way up is down. We have to come to realize the extent of our weakness. It's when we're weak that He's strong. It's a paradox, folks. Our Father uses our negatives to bring about His positives. There must be this drastic realization of self. In the beginning, we saw our Lord Jesus Christ as our substitute. Now we must come to abide in Him as our life. We need to know that God has been faithfully, faithfully carrying out His purpose for our lives through all the years of failure and frustration so that we may come to know Him as our life. Faithful is He who calls you who also will do it, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. When we're able to see our death with Him, we are able to see our position of having been risen with Him to walk in newness of life. Resurrection life. The life of our risen Lord Jesus Christ. I believe this to be the greatest parallel in all of God's Word. Only through His death could He bring us forth unto life. Likewise, only through our having died to sin, self, and the law can we bear fruit unto God. And this is the area we are now passing through in our study of this marvelous book. Until next time, I love you all. I truly do. This is Steve. Thanks for watching.